Thanks to the generous support of an anonymous Patreon, I have resumed development work on my Direct Granules Extruder. Here you can see version number 4, with which I was able to take a big step towards a reliably functioning extruder. It looks quite prototypish, because that's what it still is. Version 4 is, for the first time, an all metal extruder at the core of the design. Due to a lack of cooling, it initially worked very poorly, which is why I will go into a little more detail about the necessary temperature distribution in my extruder design in this video. I made the tube out of brass and stainless steel. The lower part was made on my lathe from 10mm round brass. An M6 thread is cut into the material at the bottom, so that standard nozzles can be screwed in. A 6mm hole goes from top to the thread. There is also an 8mm hole about 2mm deep. This serves as a guide for the 8mm diameter stainless steel tube of the upper part. The two metals are braced so that the two parts remain permanently connected at temperatures below 500 degrees Celsius. At the top end, the stainless steel tube has cuts that are approximately 2mm wide and 3mm deep. These help the screw to grip the granules and push them into the extruder. There is still room for improvement here, too. The upper part is braced to a piece of copper pipe with a diameter of 15mm. This part of the extruder must be kept at temperatures below 40 degrees Celsius. In the first attempt I used the original 40mm fan of the printer. It didn't work, so a larger fan with 60mm diameter followed, which, however, also couldn't generate a sufficient cooling effect. So I sealed the copper pipe and switched to water cooling, and that was the breakthrough to a reliably working extruder. The lower part of the extruder needs to be heated. Therefore, as is usual with filament printers, I made an aluminum block with holes for the extruder tube, a heating cartridge and the temperature sensor. The granules must be well cooled at the top to keep them in solid state so that the screw can grab them and push them downwards. On the way down, the plastic has to melt in order to finally be extruded. When transitioning from solid to liquid, there is an area in which the plastic is extremely viscous and also sticky. The stuff is difficult to deform in this temperature range and sticks to the screwdriver and therefore also to the walls of the tube or the conveyor screw in the extruder. In this phase, the largest force is needed to forward the material. Therefore, the transition from solid to liquid should take place in as short an area of the tube as possible. There is heating at the bottom and cooling at the top. To put it bluntly, heat flows from bottom to top. The more heat flows, the more heating needs to be done at the bottom and cooling at the top. In my previous extruder designs, I implemented a glass block as heat barrier. That worked, but it was tricky to recreate, because the heat flow determines whether an extruder works or is extremely sensitive to clogging issues. In the all metal extruder, the stainless steel takes on the function of the heat barrier. With around 25 watts per meter and kelvin, the thermal conductivity of stainless steel is only a fifth of that of brass. In addition to the material properties, the dimensions are of crucial importance. The smaller the cross section of the material, the less heat flows from the hot end to the cold end. 
The stainless steel tube I chose has a wall thickness of 1mm and is therefore rather thick walled. I have already ordered thinner walled stainless steel tubes. What else is the heat flowing through in the extruder? First of all, of course, through the material to be extruded, which is the plastic. The thermal conductivity of PLA is only one hundredth of stainless steel, the metal used in the upper part. While speaking of metal, of course, the auger screw also conducts heat. The advantage of my design compared to classic extruders is that the screw diameter is significantly smaller than the inner diameter of the tube, so there is a clear gap between the screw and the wall. This area is filled with plastic, which acts as an insulator and thus significantly reduces the heat flow through the screw. Furthermore, in classic extruder designs, the screw extends all the way down into the zone with the hot, melted plastic. In my design, however, it is sufficient if the screw only goes into the extruder a little beyond the cold area. The material is moved by pushing the cold, solid granules downwards. The wood screws I use have a significantly smaller pitch than conventional extruder screws. This means that less material is moved per revolution with a higher force, which means that the material flow can in principle be dosed more precisely. As a second function, the gap between the screw and the extruder wall allows the trapped air bubbles to escape upwards. So what can the prototype seen here print? My aim is to be able to print quite fine structures with a standard 0.4mm nozzle, so my test object is a link of the tracks of one of my robot vehicles. The dimensions are only 27 x 25 x 12 mm. The STL file is available for download on my pages, so you can see how small the component is and how well your own filament printer can process the job. You can see that there is no part cooling fan attached to the printhead. In the current experimental phase, my first priority is to achieve constant extrusion. All the tests demonstrated the reliability of the extruder. Apart from clogged nozzles due to impurities in my recycled raw material, version 4 is already working exceptionally well. The track link is printed here with a constant extrusion width of 0.45mm and a layer thickness of 0.2mm at a print speed of 10mm per second. This was the standard in my current experimentation phase to see how consistent the extrusion is. The slow printing speed also makes it possible to identify weak points during extrusion. With these settings, the print job takes approximately 45 minutes. Let's increase the print speed to 20mm per second with otherwise unchanged settings by dialing the parameter called frame rate in the printer menu to 200%. The mechanics I use is from the early days of consumer filament printing, so it is anything but up to date. The mechanics rattle and the frame is anything but sturdy. Ghosting on the edges and wavy surfaces are clearly because of the weak frame. The nozzle sometimes hops over the surface, creating gaps on the walls. If the printing speed is set to 30mm per second, the effects of the weak mechanics become even more noticeable, but the extruder at least delivers the necessary material throughput. This also applies to a printing speed of 40mm per second. Printing beautifully looks different, 
So let's stop to overtax the printer mechanics. However, the old printer has a few advantages for experimenting. The printing parameters can all be adjusted via the menu. Modern printers usually only offer very limited options here. The plugged in motor drivers are worth their white in gold when tinkering around. On the driver for the extruder, I cut the pins for the step size, so that the motor makes half steps by hardware. Not an absolutely necessary measure, but it allows the extruder screw to be turned faster by the printer's old, low performance microcontroller board. I destroyed the transistor for the hot end in an earlier experiment, but this wasn't a big problem thanks to the openly accessible motherboard. A power MOSFET now controls the electric energy. The extruder can be heated to the printer's maximum value of 260 degrees Celsius with a 12V 50W heating cartridge. Also it takes a few minutes to reach this temperature. Once the extruding works fine, a better printer mechanics will undoubtedly be necessary. The tracklink scene here is printed with variable extrusion width and print speed, which means that the extruder has to deliver a variable material throughput. As already seen, stringing inevitably becomes a problem that cannot be ignored, especially with higher material throughput. When it comes to retraction, granular extruders develop their own problems. When extruding, a non-negligible force must be exerted from top of the screw, which causes the mechanics to bend... ...and even break if the force becomes too large. I illustrate the bending of the mechanics here by loosening the fastening screws of the extruder motor, which is why it moves to the upper stop during extrusion. When retracting, the direction of rotation of the screw is reversed, which means that the bend in the mechanics must first be reduced again before the screw can raise the plastic and the retract begins to take effect. The screw plunges into the extruder, initially displacing more material before finally reducing the pressure inside. With parts of the mechanics made of not so sturdy printed plastic, a full turn of the screw is necessary to get the stringing issues halfway solved. You can see that an unwanted extra nub is printed every time the extruder screw dives down during retract. This can be improved not only through a more sturdy backlash free mechanics, but also through a better thermal design. If the neck of the extruder can be shortened, less vertical force is required for extrusion and the torque with which the extruder screw is turned will also become smaller. By lowering the gear ratio of actually 5 to 1 or even a direct drive, the retract can be accelerated enormously. More precision in rotating the screw also leads to more uniform extrusion. The coupling used in the first place had clearly visible problems... ...which have now been improved, but not yet completely ironed out. So there is still a lot to do. If you would like to help me financially with my development work on this and other open source machines... There is further information on the extruder project and the donation button on my pages. Many thanks to all the great people who have already made use of it. If you would like to take a closer look at the capabilities of Extruder V4 in its current development phase, the approximately 20 minute printing of the track link is available as an uncut video without any spoken comments. With that you can see and hear what currently works and what still doesn't. 
keep in mind that this is a fairly small component that is printed with recycled plastic. I'm also continuing to work on processing old prints or pulverizing fresh pellets. Thanks for watching and I'll be back.